The uh, next uh, witness is Christina C. Anderson, uh, used to be a former employee with the First Department Disciplinary Committee. I think we, 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 should, we should try to keep our, no, no need for applause, ladies and gentlemen. We're just trying to keep an orderly process and just keep it moving. Ms. Anderson, thank you very much. We, we're going to try to keep it within the five minutes. We allowed them to go over to just explain yeah. the process to lay the groundwork, okay? So you could just do five. No problem, Ms. Anderson. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank we just you. want to get to the, to, we have your statement. We've read it. We just want to get to the heart, so we're going to be jumping okay. in and ask you questions. Uh, I should also uh, start by saying that um, this statement is uh, drawn solely from allegations set forth in my federal court complaint. It is therefore comprised solely of publicly available information and it is fully in compliance with the stipulation and order of confidentiality entered on February 20, 2008 in my case and based on Judiciary Law 90.10. So basically, we want to make sure presently you have a case. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, I would be happy to take questions when I have counsel present. No problem, but just go ahead. Okay. You know, it has been said that men can write perfect ethical systems, but nevertheless, they cannot stand being watched when they go out at night. And I think that to a large extent is the situation with the DDC. The DDC is a departmental disciplinary committee for which I used to work. I was a former principal attorney there for six and a half years. I alleged that uh, upon learning of the DDC's pattern and practice of whitewashing and routinely dismissing complaints leveled against certain select attorneys to the detriment of the public that the DDC is duty bound to serve, I reported this wrongdoing pursuant to my rights under the First Amendment of, to the United States Constitution and importantly, my own ethical obligations under the <clears throat> New York State Code of Professional Responsibility. In response, however, Rather than attempting to address and rectify the problem, my supervisors embarked upon a campaign of abuse and harassment of myself, including a physical assault on myself by the first deputy, Sherry Cohen. Ms. I, I, I want to, we understand that and I read from your factual statement, mm -hmm. but I want to get down to the, the, the factual background and and issues. Well, uh, the, uh, I can give you one example, sir. Uh, That's what I want to get to, some examples. Yes. I conducted an intensive investigation of a case. My caseload supervisor, Judith Stein, approved it, and so did Thomas Cahill, who was then the chief counsel. It was recommended for charges. And then, suddenly, it was dismissed. The complainant called me. He happened to be an attorney and asked me, how could something like this happen? I requisitioned the file and found that it had been completely gutted. What had been a file which was almost three inches thick was suddenly an inch, perhaps. All of my work product was taken out. Uh, Verizon phone records that I had subpoenaed were not there. And this was an actual case you worked on? Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. And the documents were missing? The documents were missing. Yes, the documents were missing. <clears throat> Another such case which I recommend and I refer to as whitewashing was a case which was uh, intensively again investigated. When you say intensively investigated, what do you mean by that? Okay, I will bring in the complainant, maybe once, twice. I'll bring in witnesses. I will have a deposition. Really? I will subpoena documents. I left no stone unturned. I had a reputation as being 
thorough and conscientious. In that case, it was recommended for an admonition because we could not really prove conversion. In fact, this was a case that a lot of my, many of my colleagues, at least four of my colleagues, and I agreed that there probably had been conversion, but we couldn't prove it. And so we had to just settle for an admonition. Instead, Sherry Cohen came into my office holding the admonition in her hand and saying, this is too harsh. I can't let it go to the policy committee because they may send it back for charges and I can't tie up an attorney on a trial for six months. And I replied, that happens all the time. And she said, no, I am going to rewrite this. And I said, you cannot ethically and legally rewrite something to achieve a, a desired outcome. You cannot skew something to achieve that outcome. Nevertheless, she said, was this six a, months. Was, mm -hmm. was this a, was this just in this one incident or you discovered a pattern? I discovered a pattern and I just, this is the second example I'm giving you. Okay. okay. In any event, she took nine months to rewrite it and it went by under the radar. And that is what I mean when I say cases are whitewashed. For example, another case that I had, uh, it was agreed by my caseload supervisor and by Cahill <clears throat> that there were three elements. And one of the elements was misrepresentation to us, which is very serious. Sherry Cohen looked at me very earnestly and said, Christine, you know what happens if they lie to us. They can go for charges. I don't see misrepresentation here. I only see failure to pay a lien. So she took the case from me and took out the uh, misrepresentation and he got an admonition purely for failing to pay a medical lien. That is another example. In any event, I think that you have a good idea of how the, from the uh, prior gentleman. However, I have um, a recommendation and... Um, Excuse me, one, one moment before you give the recommendation. You've given us several instances in your red marks, and you may mentioned two here. Yes. Uh, over the six years that you were with the organization, mm -hmm. how many files did you investigate? That would be difficult to tell you. Hundreds? Tens? Certainly um, hundreds. Yeah. Hundred. And uh, these instances that you, you state in your, in your written remarks in here, are those the only instances where you and your supervisor differed? No, there were others, but those were some. You wanted me to be quick. You wanted me to be quick, so I just chose those. But there were no, but others, I'll, for example. What I'm trying to determine yes. here is obviously I, uh, I think anybody disagrees with their supervisor from time to time. There's a substantial difference between disagreement over a very small percentage of the cases and uh, whitewashing and uh, activities that are improper that would justify recovery on a lawsuit. And that's what I'm trying to determine. Well, I think you make a very good point that uh, it's, you're not always going to be in agreement on a case or how it should be handled. I think you're perfectly right about that. And on certain occasions, uh, rare occasions, I would say, yes, you know, well, that part of it is not maybe strong enough. For example, there was one where um, comp lack of competence, there is a disciplinary rule about that. And I said, okay then, uh, let's let that go. You know, so that was, uh, in other words, I understand being a professional and I understand your question. What, my one recommendation that I would like to make, however, is on p the last page, which is, I think that the policy committee should be disbanded for the simple reason that it is rife with conflict. As the gentleman before said, he is with a large law firm and that they serve without pay. It is not coincidental 
that on one occasion at least, when one of their partner's brother got into trouble, that it was handled, it was taken away from me and handled very quickly and expedited to their satisfaction. I think that the policy committee is actually in violation of Judiciary Law 90.10 because they are not... Ladies and gentlemen, we can't, please, please yeah. tell the applause. Um, We're trying to... Yeah. May I ask a question? I just want to be Sorry. just so I'm clear because, uh, uh, A, you're saying that uh, there's preferential treatment uh, in this decision making, in this, pro in this process, that there are those who, because of their stature or their connections, are not uh, prosecuted or investigated or whatever the appropriate terminology is. Or handled lightly. Or handled lightly. Okay. Yes. That's, just want to be clear that that's what you're saying. Yes. Number two, mm -hmm. if I may, uh, number two, um, you also say that um, you were employed at the DDC. Um, and you were subjected to various acts of discrimination and harassment as a, as a result of your race. So now are you saying that there's a racial or a, a view at some of these cases as well, or are you just saying that as it relates to just your own particular relationship at the agency? My allegation is that there was a pattern and remains a pattern of discrimination against minorities at the DDC. Okay. For many, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please, we, the, we don't for need many any years, applause. for example, there was not one minority supervisor, although several of them were competent. Let me just finish the point, however, if you don't mind. If you are not an employee of the court, you have no right under 90.10 to know confidential information, which was just testified to. And these members of the policy committee are not employees of the court. They're not employed by the court. They're outsiders. And it do, they have no part to play because it's a direct violation of 90.10. So again, you're just saying yes. that they should be employees of the court in order to be a part of that policy committee? Or, or, or are you suggesting that there should be no policy? No committee. I'm, I'm just trying to... The latter. The latter. Well, they should, they were, we don't need a policy committee. The DA's office doesn't have a policy committee. It relies on it, the staff and the DA. You look at the U.S. Attorney's office. They don't have a policy committee. We, well, I, I'm no longer we, uh, the DDC has its staff and the court. There is no need for Big Brother. Thank you. Who appoints the members of the policy committee? Uh, they're appointed by the court. Thank you. And the Thank majority you. of, when you say the, the, there's 12 members, I think there's 12 members on the policy 12, committee? Yeah. And the majority 12, these, yes, I'm sorry. And the majority of these 12 members come from big firms, small firms? Mostly large law firms. Large law firms. Mm -hmm. As what is and, and, and go ahead? Lo, what are they partners in large law firms? When you say large, large law firms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Senator Ferguson. Okay. Uh, so why were you terminated? I was terminated for internal whistleblowing and harassed. I was physically assaulted when I reported that to the court. I have then asked to be removed from contact with Sherry Cohen, who was the assailant. I was refused to be removed from her. I asked for an ethical wall. But that, but that, but that mm -hmm. is an issue that's being taken in a, in a separate litigation. Am I correct? You, you, you have, a, you have a, a private, you have a, your own litigation going again. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. okay. yes. Okay. yes. Okay. yes. Just, one, just one final. What is the uh, racial makeup of the committee? Of the committee? Yeah, of, of the policy committee. I really don't know. And very frankly, I don't want to.